This MicroPython tutorial will take a look at utilizing the ESP32's built-in capacitive touch sensors. A simple music player will be constructed utilizing a JQ6500 MP3 module connected to an ESP32 using serial communication. The touch interface will provide feedback using pulse width modulation to vary LED brightness. Here's a 3D printed T800 endo skull. Under the skull cap is an electrode connected to a touch sensor on an ESP32. Touching the Terminator's head triggers the sensor. Zerokana. Direct contact with the electrode is not necessary. You close. Give them to me. Now. The sensor detects a touch through a layer of non-conductive PLA plastic. I'll be back. Capacitive touch provides countless options to control your projects. This is the fifth segment in my MicroPython ESP32 series. My videos are fast-paced, but my website contains complete code and notes for all my tutorials. A link will be placed in the description, along with links to prior videos, which I recommend you watch first if you're just getting started. The JQ6500 MP3 module is a great way to add sound and music to your projects. It supports MP3 and WAV formats. The device requires 5 volt power, but it uses 3.3 volt serial communication, which makes it easy to connect to 3.3 volt devices such as the ESP32 and the Raspberry Pi. It has amplified speaker and stereo headphone outputs with 30 volume levels. There's a micro USB port which can be used to upload music files from a PC. It comes with Windows support, but there's also a Linux library available. The board comes in two formats. The 16P only has a few megabytes of memory to store sound files, which is fine for sound effects like the Terminator. The 28P adds an SD card slot which supports up to 32 gigabytes of music. The JQ6500 is easy to hook up to the ESP32. The JQ6500 serial RX pin is connected to GPIO 17 on the ESP32, which is UART2TX. The JQ6500 TX pin is connected to GPIO 16, which is RX. Remember, RX always goes to TX, and TX goes to RX. You might think that you should be connecting the serial lines to the pins marked TX and RX on the ESP32. However, these are UART0, which is reserved by the system for the REPL and logging. There's also issues with using UART1. Fortunately, the ESP32 has UART2 on GPIO 16 and 17, which is available and works great. Next, the JQ6500 is connected to the ESP32's 5V pin and to a ground. A speaker is connected to the speaker plus and minus pins. The driver supports a 3 watt 8 ohm speaker. On a breadboard, I have a JQ6500 16P and a Wemos Lowland 32. I've already connected the ESP32's 5V pin to a 5V rail on the breadboard and I've done the same for the JQ6500. I've connected an ESP32 ground to a ground rail, and I've also grounded the MP3 module. To enable serial communication, the ESP32 UART2 GPIO pins 16 and 17, which are RX and TX, are connected to TX and RX on the JQ6500. The speaker plus and minus pins are connected to the corresponding pins on an 8 ohm speaker. Finally, a USB cable from the Raspberry Pi is plugged into the ESP32. This will provide 5 volt power, and also allow communication for the REPL and file management. I went ahead and wrote an open source MicroPython library for the JQ6500. It's available on my GitHub site. There are commands to control playback, volume, EQ, status, source, etc. For the code example, the play pause command will toggle the play state. Prev and next will allow navigation between songs, and set volume will control the volume level. The ESP32 has 10 touch sensor pins. They can detect capacitive variations induced by touching or approaching the pads with a finger or other object. With this technology, you can create touch buttons, sliders, keypads, and even non-contact fluid level sensors. There are many benefits to capacitive touch controls. No mechanical parts, which saves costs and improves reliability, completely sealed surfaces that are waterproof, and a modern look with a flexible design. A common demo of touch capacitance involves food, such as a banana guitar, a pumpkin piano, and assorted other produce and beverage musical instruments. Let's take a stab at some fruit. Here's an orange and a mango. A jumper wire is plugged into touchpad 5, which is GPIO 12. The other end is stuck into the mango. Another jumper is plugged into touchpad 7, which is GPIO 27. The other end goes into the orange. I've already loaded some musical chime tracks into the JQ6500, so let's take a look at the software side. Here's a MicroPython demo for the musical fruit. From time, import sleep. From my JQ6500 library, import player. From machine, import pin and touchpad. An MP3 player is instantiated on UART2. The volume is set to 30, which is full volume. Touchpad 5 is instantiated on GPIO 12, and touchpad 7 is instantiated on GPIO 27. Threshold variables will be used to store calibrated threshold values. 
These will be used to determine if a press has occurred. Before using the touchpad, a calibration is performed. Both the touchpads are read 12 times. Both threshold lists are appended with the results. Threshold 5 is set to the average value of 12 reads. And the same for threshold 7. The results are printed to the console. This gives us numbers that indicate the approximate default value for an untouched sensor. We can now monitor the pads and trigger events when lower values are read. A try statement wraps the main program loop. Touchpad 5 is read, and touchpad 7 is read. Naming the variables capacitance 5 and 7 is not very accurate because the return values are actually pulse counts, which are inversely proportional to the total capacitance. The ESP32 periodically charges and discharges the touch channel capacitors. This oscillation generates a pulse. Touching a sensor increases the capacitance, which increases the charge discharge time, and thereby reduces the pulse count. A ratio is recorded for pad 5 and for pad 7. Dividing the touch capacitance pulses by the threshold gives a percentage of the threshold. The lower the percentage, the greater the change in capacitance, and the more probable the touch event has occurred. For this demo, we'll cast a wide net. The press will be registered if the ratio is between 40 and 95%. Values below the threshold outside this range can be errors due to interference and stray capacitance. There are many software strategies to deal with errors. You can take multiple samples, you can analyze the duration of presses, you can examine the interpolation of adjacent sensors. For this simplistic example, I'm just going to use a single reading. A press of the mango will trigger the player next method, which increments the track and plays a major second above the current tone. Debugging info will be printed to the console. A 200 millisecond sleep will debounce the button press. This will prevent a single touch from firing multiple times. You may need to adjust this value to suit your application. Another check is performed for the orange. Again, 40 to 95% will score a touch. This will call the player prev method, which will decrement one track and play a note one whole tone lower. Again, debugging is printed to the console and sleep debounces the press. An accept is used to catch control C and gracefully close the program. Finally cleans up the player upon exit. I've already gone ahead and uploaded this MicroPython program, which I called Mango to the ESP32, along with my JQ6500 library. Please see the first video in the series for more info on file management. In a blank terminal on the Raspberry Pi, our shell is used to connect to the ESP32. REPL enters the REPL. Import Mango runs the test program. The calibration is complete and the average thresholds for touchpads 5 and 7 are 667 and 694, respectively. Let's see how it works. Seems to work well, but let's take a look at the debugging output. Looking at the console shows that the mango is barely registering touches. All four presses are just under the 95% boundary. For a real project, this would be very unreliable because 5% isn't enough differentiation between touched and untouched states. This would result in a lot of false positives and failed positives because the threshold value is just an average and the system will fluctuate potentially within 5%. However, the orange is working fantastic with 50% scores. This would work very well because the untouched values are double the touched values. I'm not sure why the orange is so much better than the mango. Maybe it's the higher water content or pH level. Conductivity of solutions in physical chemistry is complicated. Design validation is always part of the development process. In any capacitive touch design, there are going to be sources of capacitance other than a touch, such as capacitance between the traces, the electrodes, and the circuit ground. These are referred to as parasitic capacitance and adversely affect sensor stability. A lower parasitic capacitance results in a greater percentage change in touch capacitance, which provides more reliability because of the higher contrast between touched and untouched states. Fruit is fun, but now let's go for a more useful design, a touch-controlled MP3 player. To achieve better sensor stability, I created a PCB. There are three touch buttons on the bottom, which will be used to reverse, play pause, and forward. On the top, there's a slider comprised of five interwoven electrodes. This will be the volume control. It'll function similar to the linear soft pot demonstrated in my previous video. Another way to design a slider is with two triangular electrodes forming a rectangle. As you move a finger along the slider, the capacitance rises on one pad and lowers on the other. You can also have circular sliders, and you can increase slider resolution by multiplexing electrodes and then using an interpolation algorithm to determine finger position. The example picture doubles your available touchpads. Capacitive touch design is a very involved subject. I'm only going to briefly discuss some of the strategies that I worked into the board to achieve lower parasitic capacitance and more consistent performance. 
I'll put links on my website to several design guides that I used as references. I decided to etch the board instead of CNC milling because it affords more control of the areas surrounding the traces and the copper pour, which can play a significant role in reliability. Here's the finished board. For the buttons, rounded patterns are recommended, and they should be about the diameter of a finger, 8 to 15 millimeters. They should be spaced at least 5 millimeters apart to avoid false positives. The traces for the touchpads need to be short. They should not exceed 300 millimeters. Notice I made the trace widths for the electrodes much narrower than the other traces. Ideally, the trace widths shouldn't exceed 0.18 millimeters. It's also important to route traces away from the path of fingers so traces don't register touches. The traces should also maintain distance from ground and other traces. There should be at least a 1 millimeter gap between the electrodes and the ground plane. The ground helps reduce interference, but it also increases parasitic capacitance. Therefore, a crosshatch ground pattern is used as a compromise, usually between 10 and 40% fill. Avoid putting components on the other side of the board directly opposite the touch pads. On this board, I have most of my components in the center and the touch pads on the outside. It's a good practice to place non conductive overlays over the electrodes. This protects the pads from the environment and reduces the possibility of ESD damage. Here's 0.7 millimeter polycarbonate plastic. I painted one side black and I'm using my CNC mill to etch the button icons. The design is inverted so the painted side will be installed down and the glossy smooth side up. Capacitance is inversely related to distance, therefore thinner overlays work better, but materials with higher dielectric constants such as glass can allow for thicker displays. The dielectric constant is the amount of electric field energy that a material can store when voltage is applied. Higher provides more capacitance. Air has a very low dielectric constant, so it's important to avoid air gaps. The code for the MP3 player starts out the same as the fruit example, except PWM is also imported. Two blue LED lights on the board will provide illumination for the polycarbonate overlays. Please note that you should avoid assigning high frequency signals such as PWM, I squared C, and spy to pins that are adjacent to the touch pins. An MP3 player is instantiated on UART2, and the initial volume is set to 30. The button panel LED is assigned PWM on GPIO 22. The slider panel LED is assigned PWM on GPIO 25. The pulse width modulation duty cycle is set to 256 for both LEDs. This illuminates the LEDs for 25% of the duration of the pulse. This dims the LEDs substantially. A dict holds the eight touch pads and assigns them numbers between 0 and 7. It's necessary to specify the GPIO for each pad. Currently there's a bug where GPIO 32 and 33 are swapped for their corresponding touch pads, but this should be fixed by the time you watch this video. Another dict will hold the capacitance threshold values for each touch pad. A third dictionary stores the three MP3 player commands, 0 previous, 1 play pause, and 2 next. A fourth holds the slider patterns and associated volume levels. There are five slider electrodes. Instead of just five volume levels, since the pads are interwoven, it's possible to read when a finger is between two pads, which gives us four extra levels. There's a pattern in the bits where the ones correspond to the possible touchpad press locations along the slider. These match volume levels between 0 off and 30 maximum. It'd also be possible to measure the capacitance value percentages to get even more volume precision. However, it's not as reliable as the on-off approach. Calibration is performed. A loop runs 12 samples, and an inner loop iterates over the eight touchpads. The threshold lists are appended with the touchpad reads. Another loop stores the threshold averages for the eight sensors. A try statement wraps the main infinite loop. A variable press flags if a press occurs. Slider volume stores the bit mass pattern for the volume. A for loop cycles through the eight touchpads. Capacitance stores the read values for the current pad. Cap ratio stores the capacitance pulse count to threshold percent ratio. If the touchpad number is less than three, the current pad is one of the three touch buttons. If the cap ratio is between 50 and 93%, then a touch event has occurred. The press flag is set. The button's LED PWM duty is set to 1023, which is 100% on. This increases the LED brightness on the button panel to full and provides feedback to the user that a button has been pressed. The command associated with the current button is fired. Zero previous, one play pause, and two next. A 100 millisecond sleep it bounces the press. Debugging info is printed to the console. Else if the touchpad number is greater than three, this indicates a slider pad. A cap ratio between 50 and 95% indicates a touch event. The press flag is set. The slider panel LED duty is set to full brightness. The slider volume bit mask is ORed with the current touchpad position. This records the location of the finger along the slider. 
more debug info is printed to the console, a false press flag indicates no presses, and both LED duty cycles are lowered to 256 to dim the LEDs. Otherwise, if the slider volume bit mask is not zero, and the mask is a valid value in the DIC, then the player's set volume method is called with the corresponding slider volume level. Sleep to bounce is the slider press. Any invalid bit mask values are logged to the console. The main loop sleeps and then continues. Except catches Control C and gracefully closes the program. Finally cleans up the player and turns off both LEDs by setting the duty cycles to zero. Here's the finished MP3 player. I mounted the PCP and the speaker to a wood base. The code is up and running. Pressing play starts the current song. I hope you found this video helpful. You can support this channel by leaving a like, sharing, and subscribing. I really appreciate all the positive comments, and thanks for watching. Hasta la vista, baby.